Welcome back to Comic Book Historians. I'm Alex Grand. Go ahead and click on that juicy red subscribe button down below. Now I'm happy to announce that my book, Understanding Superhero Comic Books, will be published by McFarland early next year and is currently available for pre-order over five years in the making. One of the things that's discussed in there is the quest for superhero realism. Now, the superhero genre was first created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster in Action Comics 1, 1938. Superman! They basically got certain elements that they knew in science fiction and adventure and combined it. Well, in writing the script, I had Douglas Fairbanks very much in mind in the athletic stunts that he did, too. So, see Robin Hood and Mark Zorro. Now, as far as an alter ego, here's what Siegel and Schuster have to say about where they came up with Clark Kent. <laughs> the influence of Harold Lloyd on us and his movies. Harold Lloyd would start off as a sort of mama's boy being pushed around, kicked around, thrown around, and then suddenly it would turn into a fighting whirlwind. Now, this genre sold really well. Much to the happiness of DC Comics owners Harry Donenfeld and Jack Leibowitz, who promoted the superhero in various venues, which also attracted the attention of one of Superman's precursors, the real life Charles Atlas. Other companies tried to copy this formula. However, DC Comics did actually sue some of its competition. The people from Superman figured that uh, Shazam was just an imitation of Superman and they sued them. And lo and behold, poor Shazam lost in the courtroom. And he went on the shelf. By the early 1950s, DC Comics pretty much had their control over the superhero genre. Superman! But that was okay, because other companies had other genres to sensationalize, like crime and horror, to generate sales. <laughs> However, that ran its course when several parental groups, political figures, and notably public psychiatrist Dr. Frederick Wortham condemned the comic book industry for exposing children to this sort of material. Blood hucksters, racketeers, are dealing with bloodiness, cruelty, and with torture. However, it wasn't just crime and horror that he was condemning. He was also condemning the superhero genre itself. Superman itself is the symbol of force, power, and violence. It is utterly impossible to understand what happened in Germany unless you realize that they were imbued with this Superman spirit. Comic book publishers started to notice. Some psychiatrist named Frederick Wortham decided that all the ills of mankind were caused by comic books. Various political figures took note of this, and the most famous one, Senator Estes Kefauver, decided to examine the links between comic books and juvenile delinquency in his subcommittee hearings. But about 20 million were of the horror and crime type, that it has a bad moral effect, and that it is directly responsible for a substantial amount of juvenile delinquency and child crime. I think there ought to be a law against them. So to avoid federal censorship, the comics industry decided to put together the Comics Code, making deals with distributors to not distribute or sell comic books at the newsstands that violated a certain code of ethics. And the comic book publishers got together and they formed a self-regulatory, self-censorship group called the Comic Book Association of America. We weren't supposed to be overly sexy or overly violent. Various artists actually abandoned the comic book industry, and some decided to just veer away from crime and horror. You know, the Kefauver thing or whoever it was that uh, screwed everything up. You know, the powers that be, say, hey, they're bad for children, causing all that juvenile delinquency. You watch the news, and there stands Kefauver, and showing things maybe that I had drawn or somebody else had drawn that was bloody. I went up and... We had a fire in the winter that night, and it just sat there, and I burned them. Many comic book publishers and distributors went out of business due to lack of product. That all changed in the mid-1950s when Julius Schwartz is really the next person after Siegel and Schuster to truly advance his superhero genre by applying more realistic science fiction and more relatable human alter egos. After four or five years in which superheroes did not appear, except for Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, I decided... We put out Flash again, which is a comic I edited back in the 40s. The Flash proved to be a huge success. I was asked to put out another. But I started the Silver Age, only I didn't know it. So how did Schwartz accomplish this? Well, basically, he utilized the science fiction that he read as a kid. Of amazing stories and wonder stories. Two science fiction magazines that were published in the 20s. And both published by science fiction pioneer Hugo Gernsback. Today, most scientists take me seriously. Schwartz did an extra thing, though. He didn't just repeat The Flash or The Green Lantern from the Golden Age. He completely retconned these characters and gave them alter egos that were relatable. And the only thing I kept about the Golden Age Flash 
is the name and the super speed. Everything else I changed. The secret identity, the city where he lived, who his girlfriend was. The Flash and the Green Lantern showed a certain wonder to their own abilities. I was asked to put out another uh, revival of a superhero, and Green Lantern was also a big favorite of mine. I changed everything about him except his name. It also proved to be a success, followed immediately by the Justice League of America. His approach to the superhero comic book showed market viability, likely due to the fact that there were special effects that were not able to be matched by what was shown on television shows at the time. Man, what a blast off! However, another publisher in the comics industry was observing DC Comics' success and decided to mimic its approach to superheroes. One day my publisher came to me, I was the editor at the time, and he said, You know, Stan, I found out that DC Comics has a book called The Justice League. The Justice League of America. Which is selling very well. Why don't we do a superhero team? It started out as a copy, but we're going to do it differently. They decided to utilize the talent from various artists and writers that they hired from other companies that went out of business because of the Comics Code. Comics Code had shook up the industry. and I went back to Stan Lee and I was put on staff. Stan Lee, along with Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, did so. So we came up with the Fantastic Four. He went one step further and demanded flaws and imperfections. We'll always make the good guys not perfect, but it's a case of saying people aren't perfect. Mix fantasy with realism became an instant bestseller. That was when the Marvel Universe was born. There was Jack and I who did the X-Men and the Fantastic Four and the Hulk, Thor, S.H.I.E.L.D., Bill Everett who did Daredevil with me, Steve Ditko who did Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, and Don Heck who drew Iron Man. Now I'm not putting this all on Stan Lee. This was a team effort. And sometimes Stan Lee didn't even write some of that dialogue that has his name on it. I tried to get some help. I called one or two people I know and I said, look, could you just write a little synopsis of how the story should go that I could use when I write it just to save me time. I've had about five fellas do it. But it was his editorial direction that wanted imperfections and flaws. Suppose there were such a character who's got superhuman power. He really existed in the real world. What problems would he have? Because when I was a kid, when you were a kid, and Superman and those people were all perfect. We tried to bring comics a little more into the real world. If Woody Allen were a superhero, he'd be Spider-Man. In fact, Ditko has a really interesting story. He rejected that notion. Early comic book heroes were not about life as it is, but creations of how a man with a clear understanding of right and wrong and more courage chose to act. Today's flawed superheroes are superior in physical strength, but common, average, ordinary in mental strength. Rich in superpowers, yet help us to solve their common, ordinary, average personal problems. Steve Ditko left in 1966. Oh no, no! Ah! It was when Jack Kirby left Marvel to pursue his own interests at DC Comics, which were space gods. I went to the Bible. I came up with Galactus. They were the first gods. And the new gods evolved from those lines. I say, what's out there? Who are our evil gods and who are our good ones? And I try to resolve that. Jack Kirby's approach to space gods was definitely innovative. He was trying to create a meta-series of interlinking titles. Ultimately, however, Kirby's approach didn't fare as well in the affidavit returns model of sales. It's not fair! It's not fair! It's not fair! Julia Schwartz paid attention to the realism of the Marvel Comics approach and utilized Danny O'Neill and Neil Adams to apply social realism to comic books. Through their Green Lantern, Green Arrow comic books, they explored racism, drug abuse, situations that apply to modern America at the time. That series didn't perform well in the affidavit returns model of the early 1970s. And so that approach to storytelling was temporarily abandoned. It's not fair! And Marvel Comics skyrocketed past DC Comics. <laughs> Lee decided to expand the superhero genre into TV and film. And I'm out here hoping to put these and other properties into movies and television shows. Jack Kirby's approach to Space Gods didn't fare as well. However, it was over at Marvel Comics when Jim Starlin was able to approach a similar idea, but instead furthered the superhero genre by adding death as a factor in the risk of the superhero adventure story. Every true story ends in death. Occasionally somebody doesn't die off. It's not real. His supervillain Thanos actually trumped Kirby's super supervillain Darkseid, mainly because Thanos actually killed people left and right. 
this basically demonstrated that 60s model was a little too safe for a 70s audience. Ah! As time went on though, consumers wanted a little more hope and reinvigoration in their superhero comic books. And that's where John Byrne came in. Read comic books since I was just a little kid. John Byrne actually modernized a lot of the Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko storytelling of Marvel Comics in the 60s into something that Generation X kids could really wrap their heads around. It no longer looked dated. He actually proved that you can revitalize these characters by modernizing them, making them smarter, making them look glossier, but presenting them in new and exciting ways. The kids decided he was too super for their modern taste. We have restructured his history because a lot of debris gathered in a 50-year period. We're taking him back to where he started. And a lot of comic book storytellers have tried to repeat that same level of success in every new generation that comes into comic books. However, DC Comics furthered realism through two very important storytellers, Frank Miller. We've got to keep in mind that the main image people have of superheroes is Adam West playing Batman on the old TV show. Holy sardine! That's what had to be overcome. And Alan Moore. We can't believe in these super Boy Scouts anymore. We don't know anybody in real life who behaves like that, and the readers don't believe in them. So we've just tried to make them a little bit more like real 20th century human beings. In Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, he portrayed Batman as a cranky old hero and made him a fascist who controlled Gotham City through the command of skinheads. He also depicted Superman as overly dependent on the approval of authority figures. At the same time, bring it forward in terms of the world it lives in and the kind of fiction that you can do now. But it was Alan Moore who really took it a step further. And it's called Watchmen. And what we want to do is to actually examine the implications of the superhero if these observed characters were real, just what they'd do to the world. If there had been a Superman working for the Americans, the world would be unrecognizable. What would American foreign policy be like? By portraying these superheroes as either narcissistic, self-involved, he showed with absolute power comes a certain amount of corruption that social mission ceases to exist. Now they're just superhero jerks in a way. After this, it really seems like if a modern comic book creator ends up modernizing older characters, well, they're kind of doing what John Byrne did, just for a new generation. If they start killing characters in a comic, well, they're just really doing what Jim Starlin already did in the 70s. If they're deconstructing a superhero or portraying a Superman-type character as a really bad person, they're really ultimately just doing what Alan Moore already did. If they start showing social realism in their comics, well, they're really doing what Julius Schwartz and his team did. And so in some ways, the pioneering is kind of stopped, and we're all enjoying more of the modernization approach to it. In the 1990s, what we really have are just comic books that portray these affirmation qualities in a more of an extreme sort of way. And in the early 2000s and after, we really have the genre moving sideways. The movies and television shows. Where now the game becomes, how do we keep the superhero modern enough for new audiences?